Hello, friends, and welcome to Activate and Thrive and to our weekly Thriving Thursday chat, where we chat with uh, different, beautiful, health-minded people uh, about just various aspects of, of um, health and thriving and being active and activated. Uh, we run these chats every Thursday at noon East Coast U.S. time uh, on our Facebook uh, page, Activate and Thrive. And then we also share them on Instagram and YouTube. So from wherever you're watching, whether it's live today on Thursday uh, or some other time, we're very happy that you tuned in. And please look for these chats every Thursday. My name's Don. And I'm Mia. And our guest today is Rich Moran. Hey so, <laughs> hey there. Rich was born and raised in Braintree, Massachusetts. And he is a 2016 graduate of Bridgewater State University with a concentration in vocal performance. And as an interesting side note, he actually studied ear training with this guy, with my <laughs> husband. <laughs> um, he's an accomplished tenor. He's currently serving as cantor at St. Mary's Parish in Dedham, Massachusetts. And he's been seen in various musical theater productions in the greater Boston area, including Sweeney Todd, Godspell, and Company, with great roles in those productions. But along the way, Rich had some challenges, and that's what we're going to be speaking about today, and how Rich overcame addiction, and how that journey led him to where he is today. So, welcome, Rich. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'll start out of the gate here. When did you first realize that you had a problem? How did your story begin with that? Oh, so, um, so for myself, for me, I, I did a lot of, you know, like partying in high school and early college. Um, and binge drinking was, was a big thing for me, um, as it is for many people, you know, especially young, young people at parties and whatnot. So I just kind of blindly going and you know I, I would I would party on a, on a maybe a few times a week that turned into an everyday basis um and you know slowly but surely you know I, I would see the you know patterns in my own behavior um that became habitual um you know, like waking up in random places or you know even outdoors on like a, a bus depot bench or in a field, things like that. Um, so, so that's when I, I definitely realized, or at least recognized an issue. Um, not to say I, I, I had trouble doing something about about bettering that issue. Um, that took a few years, um, but I think for myself it evolved from you know partying on a regular basis to eventually, you know, just just drinking on my free time and, and whenever I had the avail the availability to drink. Mm -hmm. Was there? Uh was this kind of just something that happened to you or uh, were you around alcoholism at all in your life that it might have uh, influenced you or? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, a lot of my, uh, my friends growing up, I wouldn't say all of them, but uh, like me, I mean, we all, you know, we like to, we always like to have a good time. So, so, you know, as a kid, or, you know, at least as a teenager or, or you know, young adult, um, whether or not, I mean, maybe if I recognized that I had an issue, I mean, I, I may have just kind of summed it up to, oh, I'm a kid, I'll worry about that later, like a lot of us do. Um, but we've, you know, especially um, years ago, uh, when I was working in the restaurant industry, um, prior to now, um, like when I was maybe between 19 and 21, 22, we would go to the bars after work every night. And it's one thing, you know, to you have a beer or two and unwind after work, but, you know, I'd be... I would be drinking, you know, to the point where, you know, I would need it to fall asleep. So, you know, drinking in excess um, eventually on a daily basis. And, and that was the same for a lot of us. I mean, not all of us, but it was definitely a lot of us. So when it's in a group setting, um, again, I think I kind of just summed it up to, oh, we're, we're having a good time. You know, I'll worry about that later. Um, so, I mean, I was always around it. Um, for the most part, you know, whether working around it or, or you know, going out after work with uh, friends of mine that had kind of the same, same interests, same, same kind of personality when it comes to alcohol, you know. Mm -hmm. And were you, um, I mean, did you want to say, go ahead. I just wanted to ask him what he, what, what did you actually do, you know, to overcome this when you realize that I have a, I have a serious problem here. 
um, that's influencing the way that I live my life. Um, what what was the breaking point? What did you do to overcome this addiction? And if I could throw, like insert a question that comes probably before that one, okay. which goes right into that. Um, did you feel sometimes during the addiction period, I mean, you must have, that you didn't want to be this way, but you didn't know how to find your way out? Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, there, there, there comes a point where whether or not you want to accept it, I mean, you definitely recognize that you have a problem. And I think that's one of the things I had mentioned before, something that still comes to mind every time I hear the song. Um, I'm an old fool for my age. Rolling Stones has always been one of my favorite bands. It's not my number Which, one. The sorry, Rolling Stones. Oh, Rolling Stones. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and that song, Wild Horses, that line always stands out to me. You know, Wild Horses couldn't drag, couldn't drag me away. And that's how I felt in terms of hopelessness um, before I really knew, like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna break, break the chain, you know? Um, and going, you know, again, going off on the lyrics of that song, you know, the, the last time they say it, it's not, they couldn't drag me away, it's wild horses will ride them someday. And those two lines always stick out to me in terms of, um, you know, no matter how hopeless you feel, there's always, there's always a chance. I mean, no one's ever at a point where they can't accomplish something. Um, you know, you've got to set your mind, but you got to believe in yourself. And there's also, especially nowadays, I mean, there's a lot of support groups um, to help you along the way, you know, no matter how alone you may feel. So for me, um, you know, I didn't really go to those groups regularly, but I, I had a lot of support, uh, you know, from friends and, and my own family, uh, you know, especially my, my parents and my brother and my sister. Um, and I've always been very open about that. So it's not like something that I kept like inside in terms of my, my addiction. I mean, most, most people, especially my close ones, my loved ones, my good friends, I mean, they, they knew, you know, they knew how I was feeling, they knew how I would act, how I behave. Um, sorry, if I got a little, a little side. Well, track, let me just ask you, know, you did, did you, did you find uh, that being able to be open about it? You said you were open about it with your family, right? Definitely. So yeah. being able, being able to be open about it, I can imagine that might have helped as opposed to covering it up and just making it that much harder to get out of it. I don't know. That was huge for me, yeah, because I mean a lot of times, especially with addiction or, or anything, we don't we don't feel comfortable within ourselves. You know, we try to hide it, we try to suppress it. Um and that's what I was doing for a while uh, with this issue. I mean, regardless if I knew deep down that I that I had an issue and you still you don't really want to bring it to face value, at least for a period of time. And I was just kind of disgusted with my behavior, you know, like like waking up and not knowing what I did, or, or remembering bits and pieces, and thinking, oh my God, who did I, who did I embarrass? You know, did I did I offend anyone? I mean, just, just having those feelings on a, on a habitual basis, it's just not it's not a good way to feel. Um, and it, it takes a lot on your, you know, it takes a big toll on your self respect, um, your self esteem, and how you view yourself, right? Um, terms of like who you are as a person, you know, decency and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of selfishness, I think, that comes with addiction. And I'm not, that's not to say intentional. I just mean along the way, um, yeah. you know, you're always trying to feed your own, you know, your own, your next drink or your next shot or whatever it may be. You know, you're, you're always just thinking, how am I going to fulfill this for me? You know, me, me, me. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's not to say it's intentional because a lot of times it's just kind of like, you know, you're on autopilot. Um, not to say you don't realize you're doing it, but it's just like in your head, that kind of that comes first, you know? And that, well, that was a big part too. I was kind of disgusted with that part, you know? Good, so that disgust, I mean, you were willing to look in the mirror because probably many people that have addictions, you know, it's just so much a part of what's taken over their body and their mind, and you yeah. have to be willing to admit you have a problem in order to change the situation. You, so, yeah. So what was the breaking point for you and, you know, in overcoming this? Because I'm sure you reached a point where you were just like, okay, I, I got to change. So what was that point? Definitely. It definitely was. So for me, I mean, there, there, was, there was definitely a few. Um, but again, I mean, we said in my stubborn ways, I mean, I didn't really, I don't, I don't think I was proactive about actually doing something about it. So a few years after I had realized, you know, all right, I have an issue. I mean, like earlier, whether it was waking up somewhere random or for me, a big thing was, 
when I was 19, I, I wrecked a car and that was very scary and very destructive, um, you know, just in terms of property and, and, you know, how much worse it could have been. I mean, thank God I just got a few scratches, but um, in terms of what could have happened, you know, like, I, I mean, I could have, I had a telephone pole when I flipped my car, but I mean, that, that easily could have been a person, you know? Um, and at that point, you know, I realized, okay, I want to do something to kind of break this habit, but it still took me another three years. Um, oh, sorry, wait, another, another how many years, sorry? Three. So it took me just, just three. over three years. Yeah. So that had happened in 2011, uh, in April 2011, and I still didn't quit drinking. So maybe three and a half years until uh, so August 2014. And what's funny, or at least what, you know, I, I still look back and I think, you know, it was kind of random. I mean, as I just woke up one day um, in I, one of my friend's yards, like, you know, there was his little uh, huts in the yard. And, you know, I, of course, I only had a vague recollection of getting there, but I remember just waking up and I was, you know, late for work. I had to get ready for work and whatnot. And, and as I'm going through my morning routine, I, I just remember saying, like, well, why the hell, why? I'm sick of this, you know? I'm sick of feeling like this. I'm sick of doing this on a habitual basis. And I was just kind of, I didn't even plan it. Even then at that moment, I'm like, yeah, all right, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just try to give it a break, see, what, see, see where I can go from there. And um, that day where I normally, you know, my lunch break or whether I'd have a sandwich or, or, or whatever it may be, I'd always have a couple of drinks at lunch too before I went back to work. And that was the first day I remember, you know, I got a Diet Coke. And that night I still, you know, we went out to the bars with my friends, you know, people in the restaurant industry and I, I got a Diet Coke. And I just, I was like, let's see how long I can do this. And, you know, one day turned into two days, turned into a week, turned into a month, six months. And so I hadn't really set my mind to it until I was already on the way. Um, and I had a lot of tremendous support from, you know, my friends and, and, and my family. But I remember my father saying, you know, when he dropped me off at work, uh, he was saying, if anyone can do this, you can do this. You know, you've always had strong willpower. And, and I still think of that, you know, anytime that I'm, you know, like even remotely tempted or anything, I always go back to, you know, he believed in me I and mean, people believed in me, you know, it, it starts with you. It starts with, you got to make the initiative, you know, and well, that's, it is possible. You just have to want to do it, you know? Yeah. I mean, that that's huge that, again, that we talked a few minutes ago that you had that support and to have your dad saying that to you that's just that's just so major i mean as a dad myself and as parents we know that how much that means to the kids to have that support yeah. um and we we know that you were able to overcome this without like going to alcoholics anonymous or, or other groups which itself can be kind of impressive because a lot of people need that support but what if, what if somebody does not have support and is kind of being uh, ostracized um, I can imagine that's that much harder, um, and I, I suppose that's what maybe some of these groups are, especially for for those who don't have support elsewhere. But do you feel like the family support was part of why you were able to not go to a for professional help? Um, I mean, it definitely very well could be. I mean, I am I am one hundred and ten percent. I am all for you know group meetings and professional help, um, and I, and I've gone to them, you know not on a regular basis. I mean, just from time to time, every now and then, if I feel like, all right, I kind of want to check in on in a group setting. I mean, I, I'm a huge advocate for that because talking about it with anything, whether it be addiction or, or self-esteem or any kind of issue, um, especially in terms of things that we as humans repress. I mean, being able to find someone that you have that in common with, and there's always more than you would expect. There's always, you know, people, everyone's dealing with something, whatever it may be, but being able to have that support system it's huge. I mean, whether it be like me, like, you know, with my friends and family or, or for people who may not have that, but their friends and family in, in the groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, um, mm -hmm. any kind of group setting where you're able to kind of vent your problems and relate to one another. It's just a constant reminder that you're not in this alone, you know? Um, right. So I, I mean, I would like, I honestly, I mean, I, I, if I was being totally honest, I don't think I would have had as successful or as as smooth sailing at the time if i didn't have that support system with my friends yes of course now you um, mentioned you mentioned i'm sorry to interrupt but you mentioned um that you started to drink like have a different drink a non-alcoholic drink i think you said it was coke Diet, okay. Diet coke. i mean we're not big big fans of, of sodas we like to stay away from those <laughs> yes. that they're not healthy i'm just going to put it out there but no, it, right. it was it was a step forward from drinking so how wh what about your mindset as you said i i had a diet coke and then i'd had another one and and how, what was your mindset to be able to be strong enough 
to keep on resisting the alcohol, that's that's not easy to to resist what's become an addiction. So how, how did you do that? How did you keep on having the Diet Cokes? And you don't have to tell us now, but we hope you've transitioned from Diet Coke, but that's another subject. <laughs> it's funny that you asked it because it is very true. I mean, I'm a huge, huge seltzer drinker. I drink seltzer water like it's sometimes uh -huh. even more than still water. Um, and so now when I go out, I mean, it's different. Like if I'm having something to eat, I like something flavored, so I might still yeah. get this. Here right. and there. Like during the day, like when I'm at work, I just get lemon seltzer all day. Um, so That's I'm good. Basil and mint in there. So, so then back, back, back to the... Uh, Not to back, right? Yeah, back to the, uh, like, as you went forward, you, your mindset, were you just so strong that you were able to just not take a drink? Did you feel? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, um, I mean, I, I definitely, you know, I, I had that you know, you got to believe in yourself is one thing, but also like there's that, there's that fixation factor, which, you know, obviously you want it. Like I, I want to drink right now. I mean, I, I always will. You're always going to want one, but it, it's just, you know, being able to set a precedent in yourself that you don't necessarily need one is huge. And a lot of it, even though alcohol is very, very much so physically addictive, a lot of it for me is the mental addiction. Um, same thing with cigarettes, like in terms of fixation, right? So, so for me, it's the habit of not having it now, which is why I always have something, you know, something to sip on, whether it be coffee or, or water or seltzer water. A big, big part of that um, for me was like a social anxiety thing. So, I mean, as long as I have like a water bottle or, or you know, even coffee, I try to watch that because of caffeine intake. But something, something that I can you know, have that go to to be able to, to we have a, drink, even though it's not alcoholic, that's huge for me. Because I also, have a, I'm sorry, what was that? Mean? No, I was just, I was just going to interject. We have a very healthy drink we'll talk to you about later. <laughs> good, good for, for, our, for our audience, we do uh, have a beautiful, healthy drink that definitely is a great replacement for, for uh, Diet Coke or even seltzer water, although seltzer is definitely better. But yeah, if people are looking for something that, that strength, strengthens their, minds and everything we'd be happy to share more about that but uh you also said that uh you know the the desire to have a drink may always be there so it sounds like this is a kind of even though you have been dry for seven years it's still kind of a, a life work to keep on staying in that in that kind of place where you i mean have you have you been tempted in the last seven years to the point that you almost drank or have you really been kind of able to fend it off yeah yeah, so, I mean, I, if I think back to, I mean, definitely that first year was the hardest, or I mean, even half the year, like the six months. Um, and it's really, I mean, the first step is just breaking that that pattern cycle. I mean, that's a big part. Um, and, and, you know, everyone's different, right? So, like, for me, um, I mean, towards the end of it, I was probably drinking, you know, all day, every day. But for me, for the longest time, I was kind of like, you know, I'd be okay until 4 or 5 o'clock. Um, but then when I'd start drinking, you know, I, I couldn't just uh, – two, I'd have to have 20, or I would just have to drink whatever's in front of me. So there was kind of like, you know, no limitation thing right. for me. So then, late, so then later on, later on when you've been free, you have, you've been able to not be tempted in that direction, obviously. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And there's always going to be times when, like even right now, like, I mean, I would like to say, oh, I'll never drink again, but, you know, I, I can't predict the future, and that that's my ultimate goal, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, I, again, that's where that kind of one day at a time just kicks in. I mean, it's just, it's just a constant reminder of how far you've come and, and you know, different coping mechanisms and what I've done since then in order to, to stay where I'm at now. You know? yeah. So much of it has to do, as you mentioned earlier, with belief in yourself and with mindset and with deciding what kind of life that you want to have because all of us are creatures of habit. And yep. so we tend to repeat what we're used to. You know, that's our mm -hmm. comfort zone. And so in order to not repeat what we don't want to have, you know, be a duplicative situation, you know, then we have to create new habits. So on that subject, um, have you created new health, healthy habits that help you with your daily protocol in just staying healthy? Yeah, so for me, a big, a big part of that is just um, staying active. So um, personally, I'm a huge fan. You know, I love being outdoors when, when I can. Um, and where I'm in the Branch and Quincy area, we don't have a ton of woodsy areas, but I love going for hikes. So like I'll go to Blue Hills at least a few times a week. Um, you know, I used to go a lot more often. I kind of was working less. I'd go sometimes on a daily basis. Um, and, and honestly, just being one with nature 
is very serene to me. Um, you know, just finding your your inner being with with um, you know all that's out there in that natural habitat. That's huge for me. Um, I've got to assume that perhaps you weren't doing that kind of thing during the period that you struggled. No, right? anyway, it was often. No, yeah, when well, we were, you know, especially kids, you know, we go out in the woods to drink or whatever it may be. Right, it's hard, right. But, like a lot of kids do. Uh, right. I mean, I'm not going to, because, you know, in terms of, you know, what we did in terms of set, setting, you know, like that was also a part of like when I was younger, you know, if that's where I was to have a good time. So going back there now in terms of, um, going back there now for for exercise or for or you know peaceful state of mind it's totally different um it starts with that it starts with that doesn't it i mean everything that we do in life we want to start our day with that peaceful mindset and so that we're not living in reactive mode right yeah definitely Uh, um another big part for me was um you know i've always i've always been a musician uh before college i definitely wasn't you know, it wasn't something that I, I focused on nearly as much as when I went to school for music. But when I quit drinking um, 2014, I was in my, or going into my third year at Bridgewater at where I went to college. And I just wholeheartedly, you know, just delved into the practice rooms whenever I, whenever I um, had an urge to go out to the bus or, or in that area, you know, to go out to Bogots for a little bit or something. I would always just try to sit at the piano bench and see where that took me. And I just threw myself into the, whatever I was, I was working on musically. And that was huge for me. Um, yeah. Music was an outlet for you then to take you away. From that. That, yeah, it, all, it always was an outlet, but especially at that point, it became kind of like a new um, or like another, another kind of outlet for me right. to express myself with other than sitting in the bar room. You know what I mean? Right. Do you have mentors, Rich, that you look up to that you think, well, I would love to have that kind of influence in my life or um, that person inspires me to be more this way or that. Do you have specific mentors? I def- definitely. I mean, I, I shouldn't say maybe not necessarily mentors, but um, like fr- a couple of friends of mine, one in particular was a very good friend of mine growing up who, who was going through a very similar thing. Um, and he, he went through rehab and, and, you know, the process of getting clean and sober right around the same time I had, just before I had quit drinking. So being able to have, uh, you know, not only someone you know to be able to talk to and, and relate to and, and have each other's backs, but, you know, also a very good friend of mine uh, for many years, you know, since high school. That was huge. Um, and meeting people along the way, uh, whether it be at work or, or, you know, friends of friends who, you know, you'll be at a party and you realize, oh, I'm not the only one. Oh, he's sober too. Or she's sober too. So, so being able to relate and connect on that level, you know, again, it's always just kind of knowing that you're not alone in this. Right. Well, you know, mentors can also be people we don't know, you know, like somebody who you've oh, looked, sure. you know, somebody's career that you just think, wow, I would love to have a similar type of career, you know, so they can be people that just like inspire us to be more than we think we ever could be, right? Definitely, yeah. Um, so l- let me ask, um, a- as we uh, bring this to a close here, because we like to respect people's uh, time, um, sure. just for, for anybody uh, who says, you know, this sounds great, uh, I'd like to be able to, I, I resonate with what he's saying, but that's where I am right now. I'm still dealing with this addiction. Well, what are one or two nuggets that you could share just to give someone something, like it's that, that like first rung on the ladder, that they could grab onto to help help them out. So, if I were to recommend, I mean anything. I mean, it's, it starts with the mind. The mind is huge, and, and I don't mean that in terms of, you know, like in terms of being harsh on yourself. But you got to be kind to yourself. But but welcome it. Welcome all of those, whether they're you know uh, insecurities or whether they're kind of like self doubts that you have about bettering yourself. Don't don't shy that way. Don't don't push that down. Like just like all of us, like myself, like a lot of us are have a tendency to do to shy away from. You know, welcome that. Give it a seat at the table. Um, mm. You know, open up. Have, have it open up to you. Open up to them. Uh, you know, think through these things and always always believe in yourself. I mean, the second you start doubting yourself, that's that's when. I mean, it starts with yourself. So I mean, the second you start doubting yourself, I mean, you're setting yourself up for. I don't like to use the word failure, but, you know, you're setting yourself up for, for a, a struggle, right? So, I mean, 
it's so much of it comes to the power of the mind of believing in yourself uh, with anything, whether it be diet or exercise or addiction. Um, and just see, just see how far you can take it. You know, I mean, a lot of times, and especially nowadays, it's great that there's so many support groups and systems out there. Um, and if you think about it, it's kind of crazy in terms of the realm of time. I mean, AA has only been around since maybe the very late 1930s, I believe, mm-hmm. I think 37, something like that, at least in terms of documentation. Yeah. And that's not even 100 years. So, um, you know, just being able to know that, you know, you can always change. You can change yourself, change your patterns, change your behaviors. And, and that's... Think higher of the capabilities of yourself, you know? In a so, moment, you yeah. really can. It can be instantaneous yeah. when that light bulb goes on inside and the decision. Mm-hmm. It's about making a decision. Wouldn't you say more than anything? You made a decision. Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. believe believing in yourself and also being able to open up about it. Those two yeah. those are two little things somebody can take forward with them who's struggling. Well, Rich Moran, we want to thank you so, so much for sharing your story with us today. And again, not again, I didn't say it before, congratulations on being dry for seven years. That's a big accomplishment and we offer our greatest support as you go forward with your wonderful, healthy life. Um, And so friends, um, we just like to let you know, as we mentioned a little bit earlier in this chat, we're ta- talking about drinking. Well, we have a beautiful um, brain drink, really. It's it's completely healthy, completely natural, and it's a, definitely a great substitute for alcohol and for sodas, um, and it just helps us think clearly, and, and um, we love it. gets rid of brain fog. So we just wanted to mention that if it's something you'd like Positive to mood. know a little bit more about, as well as uh, uh, other very significant uh, health products that we are working with here. Um, so... Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today. And uh, please uh, look for these Thriving Thursday chats every Thursday at noon, East Coast, U.S. time, on our Facebook page, Activate and Thrive, and then post it to YouTube and Instagram later. Thanks so much for joining us, Rich, and all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.